Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, this episode is with Adam Turtle. Now, Adam is a self-described beatnik, and I would add to that scholar and researcher who has spent much of his life researching a lot of rare plants in the U.S. that can be used for regenerative purposes, but much of his time and effort has been spent around bamboo. And so that's where we spend a lot of this episode is discussing bamboo. And we talk everything from the research farm he operates and the over 300 varieties of bamboo he's worked with. We talk about his thoughts about building soil. We talk about his philosophy on life. Talk about how he got started with actually the nursery. They didn't start out to have the nursery and they ended up developing their niche, which was providing large, high quality bamboo clumps to a lot of the zoos all over the U.S. is how they got started. And then it's moved into more of plantings and other areas. And they're at the farmer's market. So they sell through the farmer's market. They do do some mail order as well. So you can check out their website. But it was a fascinating episode. And and even if you're not interested in bamboo, I highly encourage you listen to the episode because not only do we talk about bamboo, but we go into what Adam over his 80 years of being involved in the regenerative agriculture movement has learned. And a lot of the wisdom that comes from him is not just about bamboo and not just about growing but just about life in general. Again, being around for um, the number of years he has, has a lot to share. And I felt privileged to listen to him for about an hour. And uh, he a couple times wanted me to make sure I send a CD to him of this talk so that he can go ahead and listen to it. Um, And the first time I called him up to ask him to do the podcast, he was like, I was like, hey, you know, Adam, do you want to do a podcast? I talked to his wife and I got him on the phone. And he was like, "Uh, first, Michael, you're going to have to tell me what a podcast is. So... Yeah, Adam's a, a, a lot of fun, and um, I know you're going to enjoy this episode with him. So please help me in welcoming Adam to the podcast. Hey, Adam, how are you doing? Oh, I'm falling apart. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I appreciate you being willing to come on. Well, if it helps spread the word and inform people and make stewards out of consumers, I'm for it. That's awesome. All right, so why don't you just um, start by giving us a little bit of a background about who you are and um, and what you do. 80 years and five minutes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, where to start? Um, born in Arizona to a military family uh, before the war. Tried to pay attention and learn as we went. Have lived all over the world. Um, started school in, in Japan. Uh, my father was part of MacArthur's government. Uh, lived all over this country and, and several others, was a cowboy for quite a while, commercial fisherman. Jack London was one of my idols. He okay. and Jack Kerouac and my Uncle Jack, my mother's uh, elder brother. So the three Jacks is what got me through. In the late 60s, I was um, a sculptor in Coconut Grove, Florida, right outside Miami, and was doing well. But friends of mine came by, they were going to go protest the Savannah River nuke up in Georgia. And I was busy. I didn't have time to go protest. I was working on my sculpture and having fun. But they left me literature. And I read it, and I decided I will not participate. So three months later, I liquidated everything, unplugged, walked away. I uh, had a little country place up in North Florida on the Swanee River, tried to start a commune there. Timing, I guess. Uh, lot, lots of yuppies that, that wanted to go play hippie. I wasn't a hippie. I was a beatnik. I'm too old to be a hippie. So that didn't quite fly, and my former wife and her lawyer decided it was worth way too much money for me to keep. So they pulled the rug out from under us, and I was all set to emigrate to Argentina had found a big piece of land, 15,000 hectares in the mountains near Bariloche for 12,000 American dollars, which I had. Mm. Um, And I came to Tennessee to say goodbye to an old buddy of mine and fell in love with Tennessee and decided, no, I should grow where I'm planted. 
Mm. So uh, I've been here since uh, 74 and joined a commune which kind of faltered and ended up with an absentee board of directors, and I couldn't really participate in that. So that didn't work. Uh, started with permaculture in either 80 or 81, I don't recall. The second course offered in the U.S., with Bill Mollison and Andrew Jeeves. Mm -hmm. And it sort of organized all the stuff I'd been working on, gave me a philosophical framework, which Mm -hmm. is really useful. And, of course, he coined the term, think globally, act locally. Mm -hmm. And that that is really the guiding principle to turning this mess around. So I've been, been working on that, how to implement it, because his vision was tropical mm-hmm. and Tennessee is not mm. so ha- had a lot uh, of details to work out so I came up with the concept of Earth Advocates uh, research facility and have been doing that now since uh, 81 I guess along the way I saw na- uh, bamboo growing in Nashville mm-hmm. and I had been partly raised both in Japan and later Savannah Georgia and was somewhat familiar with bamboo, and from my ethnobotanical reading, I knew it was the most useful group of plants on Earth. Mm. Uh, I mean, the Chinese created a culture right after the Stone Age. They went into a bamboo age. made a whole lot of sense. And if you've read Farmers of 40 Centuries, King's book written in 1910, you know the Chinese are the only culture that farmed the same land for 4,000 years without wrecking it. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was 100 years ago. Who knows now? (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, that was sort of the springboard. So I went and I stopped and knocked on the people's door and asked uh, about the bamboo. And uh, it was Philostachys aurea sulcata, which is probably the one most widely spread bamboo in the southeast. Mm -hmm. Uh, The USDA used to spread it uh, in the 30s to farmers to uh, help them. So anyway, I got one, took it back, killed it by planting it in a swamp because I knew bamboo loved water. Mm -hmm. Well, it likes water. It requires drainage. Uh Aha. Yes. And so I killed my first one in 79, but I kept going um, and started uh, accumulating more to try. I realized that not a whole lot was known in the West uh, about bamboo. So I spent 30 plus years studying it I have participated in four books, including one with Chinese colleagues on temperate bamboo, which is uh, my specialty. Mm -hmm. We built a collection of a little over 300 uh, species and cultivars while proving about 50 more that potentially were satisfactory weren't in reality. Mm. Uh, Oddly enough, a lot of them could handle our winters but couldn't handle our summers. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they can take 10, 20 below, but they can't take 75-degree nights, ah. which we can have. Uh-huh. And that doesn't appear in any of the literature, um, unless I've mis- mentioned it in one of the, the books that, that I messed with. So anyway, we have bamboo from knee-high ground covers up to potentially 60, 70 feet. Wow. Uh, the largest we've so far been able to raise in Middle Tennessee is Philostachys uh, vivax, which can reach five inch or better diameter. Unfortunately, it has a thin wall, so it's not good for, for construction. There's lots and lots and lots of other uses, everything from uh, canteens to cups to like, using it like an ola. The, the Mexican um, ceramic jug that's buried in the ground to slow release water to the mm-hmm. roots, bury a section of bamboo and flood it. Same principle, and it will biodegrade over time. We, we do that with, oh, winter squash and, and things of that sort. Mm-hmm. So that was part of it. In 91, we, uh, well, I married Sue Turtle. She was then Sue Copas Ross in 89. And we decided we had to move down here. So we we found a piece of land, a rough, abused piece of woods, and bought it to work as a lab for to demonstrate the usefulness of our various theories. And we also uh, disproved a a few. But Mm -hmm. 
And since we're on the edge of the woods here, uh, we're, there's deer, groundhog, possum, coons, squirrels, rabbits, occasional armadillo or red fox, etc. So we are living in their house. Uh-huh. And I don't really care for, for declaring war on anything. So the issue became, how do we learn to peacefully coexist? Mm. We learned what goes inside the fence and what goes outside the fence. Okay. Which is crucial. And, mm-hmm. of course, space inside the fence is scarcer than space outside. So you don't want anything inside that would fare okay outside. But if you put something outside that shouldn't be, it's going to get predated. All a big learning curve. We don't know enough to do what needs doing. We, we know a rough idea. And we grow you know, 75, 80% of our food here. Uh, we raise chickens, turkeys, and rabbits for domestic meat, as well as I occasionally harvest deer, groundhog, coon, etc. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, six, seven years ago, we had possum for Christmas dinner. Sucker got too close to my chicken house, and I can't allow that. Mm-hmm. So put him on the table. Uh, that's where it worked. Besides all this, oh, in the fencing, we developed coon-proof fencing. So it took me 15 years to learn how to grow sweet corn and get to harvest some in this location. Mm. But now we do. So it was worth the 15 years of try this, try that, companions, repellents, none of that worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, We finally came up with with a fencing strategy. Uh, I think it's on our website if anybody wants to look, uh, which I hope you are, are making available to people. Oh, absolutely, yeah. What else is is relevant? I'm an ethnobotanist, so we're constantly reading what might work, Uh and we'll acquire it and try it. If it succeeds in one location, then we'll start experimenting with it and find out what its parameters of performance are. Uh What will it tolerate? To me, efficiency is not person hours, but land use. They're not making any more land. Mm. And when we consider we have unemployment, that means we're not using the person hours very well. Yeah. We should have full employment across the board all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, What village would choose to have ignorant or sick or poverty-stricken people? Yeah, none. And, And in traditional village culture, there's no such thing as poverty. Nobody has much money, but it's okay. And if anybody is sick, everybody else stops to give them a hand. Mm-hmm. We've lost that. We've, we've gotten into all this me stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's going to drag us down. Yeah. I mean, li- living a fat and happy life on the way to the poor house or the grave, that won't work. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the preface. I, I left out probably 95%, but uh, <laughs> it, it gives an idea. Working on the soil, we, we got the book Teeming with Microbes. I think maybe, well, before that, we got the book Dirt by David uh-huh. Montgomery. Uh-huh. I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with it. He's yeah. a geomorphologist at Washington State. And Sue heard him speak at a bamboo conference and got his book, and so I read it. It's the history of civilizations as told by their soils, which is crucial. Rather than continuing to reinvent things that didn't work in the past, we need to study the things they learned and build on them. Uh-huh. So that that was that was the beginning of, of that phase of things, and then the book Teeming with Microbes, T E A M, by Lewis and Llewellyn came out, and it's the definitive study on the the subsoil uh, community, what we now consider our micro livestock. Yeah, and we all depend on them. They are the farmers. Mainly, our job is don't interfere. So we don't allow bare dirt. I mean, when we dig our potatoes, we have it remulched within an hour. Everything is mulched, wintertime cover cropped and green manured. And we started with rocky red clay. My dirt now looks like chocolate cake. Mm. German chocolate cake. Mm, that's Big even better. Faces, absolutely black, uh, crumbly, sweet smelling. It's working. Mm hmm. Consequently, as an example, ginger and turmeric are two of our cash crops. 
Okay. My turmeric reaches over six feet tall. The literature says it gets to three feet. Wow. Ginger, they say to expect about a one pound return from each ounce of investment in seed pieces. Mm-hmm. You do it kind of like potatoes. I had one hand last year that went five and a half pounds. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And I use that as my my validation. Okay, you don't think it's working? Here you go, look at this. Absolutely. We grow all sorts of domestic crops, 25, 30 kinds of chilies, uh, ditto on uh, tomatoes. I don't know, it's, it's an exploration. It, it's an adventure. Uh, mm-hmm. Along the way, when, when we bought this place, it took every penny we had to, to buy it, and there was nothing here. So for $400, we bought a dead school bus and built an apartment in it and had it dragged in mm-hmm. and lived in it for four years and built the house in our spare time. When we'd get a little money, we'd buy a, a load of lumber or block or what, whatever was needed. We, mm-hmm. we bought nails in 50-pound boxes. And soon I built the house in, in our spare time, and I think we had a gross total of $14,000 in it the day we moved in in 95. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, no, actually, if you study history, it's to be expected. Mm-hmm. There was no building class as such until a couple of hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Everybody did whatever was needed, and they helped each other out. We had a totally different value system, and that's ultimately what, what it comes down to. We're, we're cherishing the wrong treasures. Yeah. So, Adam, let's talk a little bit more about bamboo because that's okay. a significant focus in that. Um, I read your article that you sent me over. Um, how much are we re- importing every single year? I don't know what current numbers are, but it's truly absurd because we could produce all we need. And even worse is things uh, I read about, uh, well, you saw it in, in the article, the mm-hmm. willow experiment for biomass in New York. Mm-hmm. In New York, Absolutely. that probably works. But in Tennessee, they're working with switchgrass, which only photosynthesizes six months a year. Bamboo photosynthesizes 365 yeah. uh, every day. So it is literally the fastest growing plant on earth. Yeah. In the spring, you said it will grow, is it like a meter a day, or how fast will it grow in the spring? Um, as I remember, it was 34 inches that Dr. Suzuki recorded in the 80s. Okay. You can't quite watch it grow, but you could measure it and go have lunch and come back and measure the difference. Wow. And it makes its entire vertical growth in 60 days or less. Yeah. So if you're talking about a 60-footer, that's a foot a day average. Yeah, I think you said the international trade is $10 billion of just the raw bamboo product. That was in 04. Yeah, so obviously it's definitely gone up since then. I would suspect. Yeah. And bamboo has a ton of different uses, too. Um, one thing you yes. mentioned was bioremediation. How does bamboo play into that? Well, it's a grass, mm-hmm. and all grasses are soil builders. The usefulness factor, there's the complete lack of erosion. Mm-hmm. It, it builds. A, there's places in Kentucky where 35 feet of topsoil have been accumulated by river cane, mm. one of the native bamboos. And it, it's a funny thing. We keep running into people, oh, it'll take over. Not if it's used. Yes, it's if it's the just wrong left. plant to be a pretty face in the backyard. That's but a really good There are a lot point. of people we refuse to sell it to. Because ah. we know they're going to get in trouble, and they're going to want to blame the plant. Yeah. That just doesn't work. And accidentally, we became a nursery as we were moving from the old place uh, over in East Tennessee, three-and-a-half-hour drive. We brought over a three-year period, 47 truckloads of plants Okay. down here. And as we're moving, oh, hey, would you sell one of those? Would you sell one of those? We made about $10,000 during the move. Selling plants we, we could spare. I mean, we, we brought uh-huh. enough to get started on various things. But we said, oh, maybe there's a need. And back then, bamboo was mail order, and they would cut the tops off and give you about 15 inch or so root ball, washed clean, and packed in, in some kind of damp medium. And that's what you got. And we got the idea in our moving things around. I bet you you could move bigger ones 
if you refined your handling techniques. Mm. So we did. The biggest plant we've successfully moved so far was 46 feet tall. Wow. Yeah. It was three canes. They were two and a half, three inch diameter in about a 60 inch root ball. I mean, it, it was strenuous. But well, in 1990, we founded the Southeast chapter of the American Bamboo Society, which is still extant, several meetings each year. We got it started. Well, one of the attendees at the organizational meeting, uh, second one, I guess, up in Lexington, was Merle Moore, who worked with the Association of Zoological Horticulturists, mm -hmm. which we subsequently joined and got connected with lots of zoos. So he was with the Denver Zoo. And in a discussion, they said they had tried bamboo, but it always failed. Well, they'd been stuck with the mail order stuff, mm -hmm. which means you get a little bitty piece, which it, it's not ready to leave its mama. We theorized that we could give you 12 to 15 footers with the tops mm -hmm. ready to go in a timely fashion. I think it was in March we, we delivered it. So he said, yeah, I'll, I'll get some money up and, and we'll try that. So we got an old horse trailer and closed it in to use uh, to transport bamboo, and we delivered that first big order to Denver. We lost our butt. Had an old Suburban, blew the transmission a couple of hundred miles out. Economically, it didn't work. But in theory, we demonstrated our idea. Mm -hmm. The bamboos lived and prospered in Denver, since we hand-delivered, we were able to help identify microclimates and suitable sites and, and mm -hmm. such as that. Yeah. So that got us started, and the word spread. We've never spent much on, on advertising. Yeah. So I'm here near Cincinnati, and the Cincinnati Zoo is full of bamboo. They've got a You notice. All, yeah, all through the zoo. It's amazing. Yeah. Most zoos are if they can support it. Yeah, but that, that that is a noticeable change from 30 years ago. Yeah. So you also just mentioned to me erosion control. I know something that is a big challenge um, in the U.S., especially the South, is Japanese knotweed, or I think it's Raynortria japonica. Mm -hmm. It's just um, underutilized. Yeah. There are books coming out now on the values of so-called invasive species. Hmm. So I just need to be looking for that book. Uh, that, I've run across several several titles. Uh, some of them are concerning medicinal uses. Other ones uh, more utilitarian uses. One of my very favorite teaching stories deals with a master Ayurvedic uh, herbalist in India. Mm -hmm. And he has a little ashram, and he accepts students. And after a year or two of training, the final exam, he sends the students out into the countryside to find any non-useful plants. Mm. And the poorer students start showing up a day or two later and with their list. But his best student doesn't show up. A week goes by, a month goes by, several months. He's still, he's wondering, did bandits get him or, or uh, what happened? Finally, the guy comes in, he's lost weight, he, he's, he's haggard. It's been several months and he says, teacher, I have failed. Mm. There aren't any. He said, I could not find any plants that were not useful. And oh, that's at the heart of my cosmology. Mm -hmm. It's never the plant that's at fault. Mm -hmm. It's never, always... Never, never, never. Japanese yeah. knotweed, kudzu. Have you read the, the book of kudzu by Shirtliff? I have not, but I'm going to put it on my list. Okay, came out, I think that came out in 70 or so. Okay. Kudzu was first shown in uh, 1879 at the Japanese Pavilion, the uh, World's Fair in Chicago. Okay. The Chicago Expo. The USDA saw it, said, wow, this is really great stuff. We'll get it introduced. So they did. And it worked fine until the mid-30s. When we started mechanizing, you can't feed kudzu to your tractor. Yes, gotcha. All browsing animals, however, will kill it unless they're, they're periodically excluded. And, and it does not stop erosion because if you get up under some kudzu, you'll see it's bare-legged. Mm -hmm. And it creates a dense shade so nothing grows. So there's more erosion where there's kudzu mm -hmm. than before.
this is cultural stuff. Mm-hmm. We, well, Pogo told us, we have met the enemy, and mm-hmm. he is us. I'm sure you've heard that. Oh, yeah. A, a better statement of his that is much less well-known, I think it came out in 52. I have the original cartoons. Gentlemen, we are confronted with insurmountable opportunities. <laughs> Hey, Michael here. I hope you are enjoying this episode so far. If you are looking to shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources. There we have a resource bundle, which contains a bunch of different eBooks that we put together over the years on everything from winter growing to wash and shed efficiency, to pastured poultry processes, to building your farm and buying the right property. One of the resources I want to highlight is our Profitable Farmers Toolkit. Now, this is something that's been downloaded by over 3,000 farmers. It's a free resource. It contains tips for setting up your farm, financial systems and apps that you can use to track your farm, our favorite tools for the greenhouse, field and wash and shed, innovative apps for farming, and how to put automated systems in place to make your farm run more efficiently. So if you haven't already, pop on over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download it today. I'm fascinated by all of this. This is great. But one of the things that also you mentioned in the article is about the timber aspect is, and I know that that's a huge thing in other countries, but in the U S it hasn't been as big. Um, go, go, go price bamboo flooring, $4 a foot. Mm -hmm. We have bamboo flooring in the house and also in the day room and also in the office. That's just one example. I was in China in Oh three to uh, attend some conferences and do a presentation at an embassy level conference and the people's government of Hubei, our hosts, gave me a card case Mm -hmm. made of laminated bamboo. I'm still carrying it. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do with tree wood, you can do with bamboo and a lot of things that would be difficult with tree wood, you can do with bamboo. Mm -hmm. What we think, oh, China's where bamboo is from. Not so. Every continent except Europe has had bamboo since the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. Before the Ice Age, Europe had bamboo. And there are bamboo cultures in Central America, South America, and Africa. Mm -hmm. So we don't know history. Mm -hmm. If you attended public school, you know the BS that's passed off as history. Well, I was homeschooled, so I think I was spared a lot of that. So you missed out on some of it. You're (laughs) very fortunate. (laughs) Yes, I was. I got thrown out of school half a dozen times for being mouthy with the teacher who was presenting what I knew to be erroneous so-called data. And kids ain't allowed to correct their elders. Yeah. So you're saying with the the timber aspects, we're still not fully utilizing what we could in the U.S. Not even. What do you mean fully? We're not using 1% of the potential. So Mm -hmm. there's biomass, there's eco services, there's the feed value. I had Mm -hmm. a buddy who who raised goats and all his goats ever got to eat was was bamboo. He'd cut Mm -hmm. a couple of canes and throw it over the fence. They'd strip it. And and, uh, Dr. Andy Lee uh, was over at Clemson University in the engineering department. He was working with engineered wood, Mm -hmm. which if you go to a lumber yard now, Big dimension lumber is scarcer and scarcer because you can't cut a 2 by 12 out of a 4-inch pine, but you'll have to laminate. Well, if you're going to laminate anyway, why are we cutting down trees? They don't Mm -hmm. regenerate to the same extent. And I think one of the things you said in your um, your article here that you sent me, um, which we will link for everyone else, is that the bamboo just regenerates so fast. Well, it's the fastest growing plant on earth. The number Mm -hmm. two candidate is giant kelp. Gotcha. Now, bamboo is also grown for fiber. It's grown for fiber. Unfortunately, all the bamboo cloth and stuff is a rayon process. So Ah. it's a better source than trees, but it's still an unfortunate process. Gotcha. Yeah, because I have a bamboo shirt, which I absolutely love. Right. But don't strike a match anywhere near it because it will melt. Oh, not good. Yeah, it's a bioplastic is what it is. Gotcha. And bioplastics are one of the things that can get us out of petroplastic. But they're still, it's, it's an unfortunate process. But if we merely use the things that bamboo is good for, it'd take, a, take us an awful long time to master it. Yeah. 
Because you can also eat it. There's shoot production on the bamboo as well, there, correct? As human food, very similar to hearts of palm, but you don't have to cut down a palm tree. can be used fresh, salted, canned, or dried. And is there a specific species that you like for shoot production? It, well, it depends in, in part on what will grow in your area. Uh-huh. Well, all of them are edible. Okay. Any that are bitter tasting because they're being harvested in the warm period, and that is cyanic acid, which is driven off by heat. Okay. So if you cook them, the cyanide goes away. Okay, yep. So that, that's not really an issue. Most of the tropical bamboos are bitter, but it's the tropics. So timing it can be really important flavor. I tell people, taste it. If you like it, eat some more. If it's a little too bitter, blanch it and taste it again. Mm. We need to develop appropriate attitudes and technology for regenerative living. Mm -hmm. For some reason, refuse to court the ecosystem and see what it will yield willingly and sustainably. Instead, we prefer to, to be heavy-handed and just take what we want and to heck with the rest of the consequences. Mm -hmm. But the consequences are cumulative. Yeah. And that's why right now we're starting to see such big changes and such big problems is because we have been accumulating these consequences for so long. Yes, it's hard to ignore the elephant under the rug. But I'm afraid what we're doing is mostly lip service and, and cosmetic feel-good stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, re I recycle my beer cans. Well, <laughs> hey, you're supposed to do that. You don't get points for it. Yeah. But if we don't change our, our value structure and, and our way of seeing the world, we're going to keep on doing like we're doing. Yeah. I ask people when, when I give presentations, has anybody here been on Vision Quest? Essentially what it is is a period of ease, social and immediately rewarding stimuli so as to create a deep calm which allows one to see essentially inside oneself. Mm -hmm. um, Self-introspection. Yeah, but beyond that, finding the place where the universe and I are one, mm -hmm. becoming a co-participant. And there's a new interpretation of Christian scripture. I just read, uh, I don't know, less than three months ago, the passage that used to read, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, mm -hmm. has been reinterpreted and I think is probably the original. It should read, awaken, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. pie in the sky someday, not get your butt to heaven, but awaken to the joys and the beauty and the opportunities we are confronted with. Absolutely. Without an attitude change, I don't see how that's possible. You're right. So we, we highly recommend to people that they, they consider Vision Quest. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how do we solve a couple of thousand years of problems in an hour's discussion? <laughs> you can't. You can't. But let's uh, move that direction. Like so, okay. some practical things that people can be planting bamboo for. I mean, we've talked about the remediation, but let's say they have a farm, they have a couple acres. How can they start integrating bamboo into their farm for, for useful circumstances? And I actually talked to your neighbor, Cliff. Um, yep, how he's yep. using bamboo. Um, he's got a number of varieties over there. But why don't yeah, you share? He got yeah. them mostly from us, and he, he's a former student of mine in one of the permaculture courses. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah, share with us kind of what practical things people can do with bamboo on their farm. If you're going to keep animals, you're going to need fencing. Uh -huh. Well, in East Tennessee, we used to say people that own a car go to town when they break a shoelace. Okay. And it's more or less true. But if we're going to truly live here, if we're going to inhabit the place in, in the bioregional sense, we need to make do as much as possible with what we've got. Uh -huh. So if you've got bamboo, all of a sudden you have a bunch of options. Uh -huh. You can grow your own piping. Uh -huh. 2,000 years ago, the Chinese were using bamboo piping to bring fresh air down into mile deep salt mines. Uh, in Africa, remote villages are using bamboo Bear in mind, bamboo, uh, East Africa does have a bamboo culture. Okay. They were using bamboo to bring water from way distant. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I used a bamboo blowgun mm -hmm. as a hunting tool. In thick brush, uh, you, you don't have room to swing something. You need, need a, a different implement. Fencing fodder for animals. 
Mm-hmm. All browsing animals like it. Bamboo can be up to 22% protein. Wow. Which is pretty good. Yep. Identifying species, you need to know your climatic parameters and then look at the species performances, what gets to the size needed and has the qualities you require. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, the vivax has a thin wall. On the other hand, Philostachys nigrahinon has a relatively thick wall and is, by the way, hardy to five below zero Fahrenheit. Yeah. So that, that's a plus. So identifying the, the bamboos that do what you need. Some of the really precocious bamboos, uh, Philostachys besitae, for instance, shoots so early that in years when we, we get a false spring, what, what they call a late frost, mm-hmm. I've seen 10-foot canes lay down and rot from a frost. But the genus Philostachys has the characteristic of having a backup plan. If the first shooting gets blasted, there's a second shooting about a month later. Oh, interesting. If the first one does not get blasted, the second shooting will frequently abort by the time they're about knee high. They'll just turn yellow and quit growing and fall over. Gotcha. It's back up. In years where we do have early frost, none of the late ones flunk. Now, you can also use this as like a windbreak, right? Well, yes, but any evergreen is going to serve as a windbreak. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, bamboo can work as a windbreak. It's also a noise barrier. It makes a white noise, a mm-hmm. susurration. And building the soil is one of its best. But people who are not going to use bamboo should not be in charge of it. Sorry, I, after years and years of watching people try to blame the plant, I, I just, I had enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you can use this too as kind of like a, um, a hedge too. Now there's, and there's a difference between the creeping and the non-creeping, correct? And no, 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 no. That's a popular misnomer. Oh, ho, I'm glad I asked uh, that. I use the terms determinate and indeterminate, which actually describes the play, play, the performance. Okay. And I've only identified one so-called plumper, a determinate species, that can handle Middle Tennessee. That's Fargesia rufa. It can take 10 below zero. It can take 110 in the sun. Okay. But the other Fargesias are sensitive to the warm nights, so they, they don't perform here. So you're left with so-called runners or runners. Mm -hmm. And they're indeterminate because a bud comes off of the mother, becomes rhizome, and travels a distance. Along that rhizome periodically are additional buds, Mm -hmm. some of which will go up and become canes, some of which will branch and become more rhizome, some of which will never do anything. They're back up. Bamboo as a social model is worth studying. It's cooperative. There's virtually no waste. Mm-hmm. Actually, in a sense, you could say waste was invented by white folks. <laughs> That's a good one. By, by, by the, essentially, the, the Roman culture mm-hmm. introduced the, the concept. All right. So we've talked through all the different uses of it. Now, <laughs> are, is there, well, not, we've, a few of the different uses of it. You forgot paper making. Oh, yes. Paper making. You also talked about that, the fiber in your article. Yep, the Chinese were making paper about the same time the Egyptians were. And papyrus doesn't grow in Beijing. Okay, so that's what the bamboo is used for. One of the things. Yeah, so then for like the fibers, is that where they, do they beat the bamboo? How do they create the paper out of it? They talk to a paper maker. It's there, it's available, it, it works. Mm-hmm. And actually, for the broadest possible spectrum, it's a little bit dated, but my friend David Farrelly wrote a book in, I think, 84 called The Book of Bamboo. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it on the remaindered table at 2 and $3 per copy. I've also seen it on the rare book table at 30 and $40 a copy. Gotcha. But anybody who can track it down, it's the best broad introduction, even though some of the nomenclature is a little bit dated. But I, I, would, I would recommend it. If anybody wants to get super serious, uh, we were the contributing editors for the international English edition of the book China's Bamboo. Okay. Uh, and I think we have maybe 30 copies or so still available at $50 each plus shipping. All right. So you've got the Research Institute where you do all the research. You've got the nursery. We talked a little bit about that. Right. And people can purchase bamboo. What's the time frame? What time of year do you sell bamboos? Our digging window is from roughly mid-August until early 
March. Okay. We, we cannot dig it when it's actively shooting or when it's about to be shooting. I, I won't even walk in the groves just before shooting because you can step on a, a bamboo cane and abort it and not even know it because it wasn't mm. yet at the surface. Okay, and you've got so. a, a spongy duck layer in there. Uh -huh. uh, it's really, really complex. We could use a few thousand bamboo serros and get, give them four or five years of intensive indoctrination. But it's not likely to happen because somebody's brother-in-law owns an interest in switchgrass or willow or whatever the next big thing is. Actually, the next big thing is hemp. We actually just had a podcast last week on hemp. Unfortunately, it's still an annual. Mm-hmm. Yes. And... Yeah. Medicinally, hemp is unique. For the other uses, I don't know, I think its popularity is getting away with it. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And annuals is part of our issue. Because you have the bare soil during the winter then. Pretty yeah. much. Well, unless you spend extra money, but most people doing annuals are in it for the yield, the short-term yield, so they don't use cover crops and green manures and companion planting and such. Mm-hmm. One of the so-called weeds in vegetable gardens is purslane, which is also one of the healthiest uh, foods there is. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, yeah. they call them quelites, and they have high concentration of omega-3 fatty acids, similar to fish. Yeah, it was also Gandhi's favorite vegetable. Uh, purslane? Yeah, that's what I hear. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. We've also discovered a, a relative of purslane called talinum, also okay. sold sometimes as jewels of opar. We've introduced it at the, at the farmer's market as summer lettuce. It doesn't get bitter or fibrous right through the summer. Interesting. I will look that one yes. up. Yes, and it's perennial in zone 8. Last year it wintered over, previous year not, but it self-seeds. Mm -hmm. And it's succulent, and I've read that both it and purslane can be used for pickles. Hmm. Now, you're at the Franklin Farmer's Market, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it's a year-round market. Yeah. Uh, we're there every Saturday uh, except for August and January when not many people are planting. Mm -hmm. And so what you... we offer is plants for backyard food production, permaculture plants, and lots of obscure things. There's a citrus that does well in Middle Tennessee. There's this talinum cactus. Mm -hmm. We spent 20-something years screening various species of cactus to find out what performs best in Middle mm -hmm. Tennessee. We finally settled um, seven or eight years ago, maybe ten, on uh, Opuntia engelmanii. My main plant is five feet tall and 12 feet across and oh, wow. had 300 fruit two years ago. The fruit wow. brings two bucks a peach. Wow. So one plant occupying roughly a 10 by 10 area produce $600 in saleable produce. So you must know my friend Ray Tyler then from Rose Creek Farms. Yeah, oh yeah, Ray, Ray's a buddy of mine. Yeah, so he's also been on the podcast. Uh-huh. So yeah, yeah, I'm actually headed down there this fall, so and I'm, I'm hoping they'll stop by the market, so maybe I'll see you. Okay, well we're yeah. right next to the info tent. We're, we're the only ones flying the earth flag. Okay, all right, I will have to check that out. Can't wait. Which is the only flag I acknowledge. All other flags are divisive. All right. So anything else? I want to let you go because I know we've been going for almost an hour. Anything else you'd like to leave us with? Don't look at the horizon for what can you gain from it, but rather look at the situation for what can you contribute. Mm. Oh, that is beautiful. I've enjoyed every minute of this interview. This has been great. I've learned so much. I've written so many notes here um, of things I have to go research even further now. So... Again, Adam, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know you're a busy guy. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to uh, share this with our audience because I know they're going to find this fascinating as well. Okay, and people who want to purchase, mainly the nursery, the bamboo nursery was wholesale. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, we send out semis. Yeah. Stuff. We don't turn anybody down, but now all of our sales are through the Franklin Farmer's Market. Probably with a couple just of exceptions. Gotcha. We mail order the Korean plum mew. Mm -hmm. We have small plants of that and also the uh, hardy citrus. Okay, gotcha. We also, by the way, you saw the picture, uh, I breed uh, tree peonies. I did see that. That's really cool. Yes, and fun and beautiful and complete change of pace. 
Yes. Yeah. We got to mix it up somehow. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I don't know how you keep up with it all, but it's very cool. I, I don't. I let it sort of filter itself. Okay. There's an old saying that a person's reach should exceed their grasp. Mm-hmm. So always be you know, a little further than you think you can. Mm-hmm. And cool. it'll sort of self out according to the hierarchy of your values. What What is most important to you will get attention before what is less important. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm studying up on cranberries. We started messing with them last year. I believe they can be grown here, probably not commercially. Okay. But... If at all, if we if we can get on top of how to make it work here, then mm-hmm. that's one more contribution. Mm-hmm. Soil building is is part of what we we focus on. We make twenty to thirty tons of compost a year and use it all. So that that's part of it. Bill Mollison said, "Life is one fat foot in front of the other." That's how we live. Absolutely. Well, Adam, again, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, again, can't wait to share this with the audience. They're going to love it. Well, till next time. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to 